On behalf of the Alliance for Liberal Democrats in Europe, the next speaker is Mr. Verhofstadt. I, tell, I have the feeling that it was a very sad moment uh, Wednesday last week uh, when the British uh, ambassador uh, gave his letter to, um, to President Tusk. That was my feeling in any way. Uh, a very sad moment. And it's true, naturally, that the relationship between Britain and, and Europe was uh, never an easy uh, relationship. Let's recognize that it was never a love affair and certainly not a question of wild passion uh, between. It was more, I think, a, a little bit a marriage of convenience, uh, if I can uh, use that uh, word. So when Britain finally joined the European Union in, in 1973, after, as we all know, several blockades by General de Gaulle, the headlines were festive. Perhaps let's recognize it between us. It was impossible, maybe, to unite Great Britain with the continent, a naive, maybe, to reconcile the legal system of Napoleon with the common law of the British Empire, and perhaps it was never meant to be. But, and that's important, and I hope the EU plot is also, our predecessors should never be blamed for having tried to. Never, I think, because it's important in politics as it is in life, to try new partnership, new horizons, to reach out to the other at the other side of the channel. As I am also convinced and 100% sure about one thing, that there will be one day or another, dear colleagues, that there will be a young man or a young woman who will try again, who will lead Britain again into the European family once again. And a young generation... A young generation that will see Brexit for what it really is. A catfight in the Conservative Party that got out of hand. A loss of time, a waste of energy, and I think a stupidity. Although I continue, dear colleagues, although I continue to think that Brexit is a sad and, and regrettable event, I believe also it's important that we remember something. Remember what Britain and Europe in these more than 40 years have achieved together. It's true we may not have got the most passionate relationship, but it wasn't a failure either. Not for Europe and certainly not for Britain and the British. Let's not forget, Britain entered the Union as the sick man of Europe and thanks to the single market came out the other side. On behalf of the Europe of Nations and Freedoms Group, Mr. De Graaf. Mr. President, I send my congratulations to Ms. Theresa May, to the United Kingdom and the British people. And I say to them, you have regained your freedom and your sovereignty by invoking Article 50 by leaving the European Union. You have now regained the opportunity to flourish as a nation, to control your borders, to make your own laws, to make your own trade deals. The bureaucrats from the EU will try to make you pay about 60 billion. They'll try to force you to comply with all EU directives and standards and to accept hundreds of thousands of migrants to accept even the rulings of the, Euro the European Court of Justice. They will try to open an Ireland road for migrants to the UK. I say to you, don't give in to these demands. You're far better off outside the EU, a union which is going the way of more and more isolation. And they are calling you friend here, friend. But they want to punish you and make you bleed. Let me therefore remind you of the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill. We shall defend our island, whatever the costs may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. God bless the United Kingdom. The floor goes to Mr. Wolfe on behalf of the non-attached members. Thank you, Mr. President. As Brexit negotiations begin, it is a joy to watch the towering masters in the art of EU diplomacy 
in full flow here today. Those like Mr. Weber, whose bellicose, threatening and theatrical words no doubt entertain this chamber, but are like a pen with no point in the negotiating rooms. He said on his recent tour of the British media that politicians who fought for Brexit were allowed to grow up in a free Europe and that the UK should now pay more. Well, Mr. Weber, may I remind you that the freedom that you say you promote came at a mighty cost to Britain. It came in the blood and sacrifice of millions of Britons, those who, like my grandfather, when asked, unhesitatingly fought in the sands of Africa so Europe can be free. It came in the 120 billion it cost Britain to fight a German dictator. It came in the 5 trillion Britain contributed to NATO to help build a shield of freedom around Europe from communism. It came on the 500 billion or more we have contributed to the EU and the billions more we spend each day more than we receive. Mr. Weber, on Radio 4 you asked, Mrs. May, please tell me what leaving the EU means. Well, I will tell you. It means we are leaving a European Union that has forgotten the costs and sacrifices Britons freely gave to ensure you are free to ex exercise your diplomacy of the defeated in this chamber of the forgetful. Thank you. Mrs. Atkinson. You know, I know what a divorce is like. I came through one, and you will too. Um, both parties seek to damage each other and the kids and blame each other. You know, the kids and the bank accounts get damaged. But my ex-partner, you will recover. Your hate will lessen, but you'll need a bit of counselling along the way. Jean-Claude, get off the, balls, uh, the booze. Donald's in denial. He's in depression, trying to claim Gibraltar as his own. As so often happens when you're splitting... The, the divorce assets, and then you appoint a crack team of negotiators only to find you've got Mrs. Maelstrom in there and that she's not a trade negotiator at all. She's a sociology lecturer. And Guy, you sent in your army, you sent in your balmy army, so the one Spanish armada that's left to you to retake Gibraltar, but it didn't happen. And Northern Ireland, the only way that the Good Friday Peace Agreement is going to fail is if you start bombing us again. And one, thing, one party thinks you owe them a bonus and an income for life just because they're injured. But our bill to you is £1 trillion of contributions. That's been the amount of money that we've paid into this place. And you fouled us, so we want that back. So it's not going very well. But do you know what? We don't want to damage you. We don't want to damage the kids and your finances. Um, so let's complete a free trade agreement. Because if not, our friends at the, F at the World Trade Organization are looking jolly nice and very attractive. And I'm not seeking an affair in this divorce, but a partner for life. And I think that's where we're heading. Mr. Bay, one and a half minutes. Dear colleagues, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, salute once again the courage of the British people who managed to vote against the... Uh, prophets of doom who said that Brexit would bring uh, chaos. British democracy, one of the oldest democracies in the world, has managed to overcome all of the uh, forecasts of the globalized technocrats who are uh, dominating Brussels and even Paris. Well, there's no point in threatening the British. It's in all of our interest that this should be a soft exit with respect and calm. The UK is not leaving Europe, it's leaving the European Union a supranational body that's been built without the support of its people and even against them, making our nations powerless uh, at the expense of the uh, multinationals. Well, for too long now, people have been calling for an end to bureaucracy, the attacks on democracy, the ideologies which damages our vital interests. It's particularly the case of the dogma of free circulation of goods, capital and people. Europe, our Europe, has existed for thousands of years, and it's you who are destroying it. We need to rebuild it through useful cooperation between sovereign nations, and that's to say, giving back people their freedom, starting with the freedom to defend their identity, their culture, the tremendous heritage that we have to pass on and enrich. It's a fundamental right of the peoples to have self-determination and to remain masters of their own destiny. Mr. Lee, the floor. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, shame on all of the youths who are speaking of uh, the UK in bad terms. They're talking about punishments, about bills. Real political greatness is uh, revealed in recognizing the people's decision that the people of Britain decided to leave. And you've, there are two ways of uh, reacting. The schultz juncker model, more centralization, taking away more powers from uh, peoples and the states. Or you can do the other way. You can let the member states get on with it and decide things for themselves. You can let the, the parliaments of the member states take decisions. You like, allow direct democracy uh, in the member states. Allow that to take president of the European Union. I think we should to try to reach out to the UK with friendship. We need sensible cooperation. You know, stop using these uh, childish comparisons of a divorce. Uh, act like grown-ups uh, in a level-headed way, in a professional way, so that both sets of interests can be served.